Is it fair to say that Attack of the Clones is the worst Star Wars film? That George Lucas was responsible for? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. Yes. Sorry. Thank you Sorry. for the clarification. Excellent distinction. I don't, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I believe it's yeah his worst. So the years between The Phantom Menace and Attack of the Clones, overall, how do we end up with a worse film from 99 to 2002? It's like you have this idea and this conception of 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 what he's trying what he's trying to do. It's not received in the way that he expected. And then in this weird way to try to be um, reactive to the criticism without acknowledging the criticism. It's almost like you're just making it worse. You know what I mean? It's a love story and it's a mystery. And these are two things that George Lucas has never established that he has any alacrity with it it's just like so much good lovin's in in george lucas movies i mean there's romance but even with like the han and leia aspects of empire those had to be refilmed because they were not they didn't work the first time so it's like i would say a lot of that has to do with really good actors who actually had a personal history and there was a lot of that on the screen and then you go jump ahead 20 some odd years and you have it's not the good ingredients for a love story. It's just there's no organic development. It's all just situational. It's that heist movie where people only hook up because, well, you know, we're stuck on this boat and we we're done, you know, we're done arguing, so now we have to start kissing. And I mean, it never gets to that point, but it it doesn't make any sense of why they fell in love, and that's a real issue. And it's it's poor writing. It's it's also the most disjointed of of all the movies. Um, I don't think I honestly think they started. I don't think they had a finished script when they started shooting. There's a big gap in the end where it's like he had to put in like action sequences because he didn't actually have a full, even though it turns out to be the longest Star Wars movie by a good 20 minutes or something that, you know, it's like he put in this, he put in a lot of flab, like the ridiculous droid foundry, which in some ways I think was his way of trying to fix the weak love story by going like, don't pay attention to this love story. Look at all this fun action and comedy and slapstick that's going on and the, the just the energy of, of what's going to happen is going to carry us along. And it really doesn't. Um, again, the mystery aspect is so confusing to this day. I think there's still people, including myself, that I, I'm just like, OK, so who is the sifo guy? Why would you just show up and be like, well, we are your clones are paid for, so you can take them whenever you want. It's like, OK. And it's just. He, it seems like he's dealing in in storytelling mechanisms that he has no comfort with. And yes, the dialogue is, you know, atrocious. The motivations of the characters are just confusing. I mean, just the one of the first sequences during the assassination attempt. And it's just so telegraphed that something bad's going to happen. Like, oh, I guess we shouldn't have been concerned. Boom. And then there's a dying woman there we don't know. And then at, in her dying breath, she apologizes to Padme for like, oh, I didn't protect you. And it's just like, what? And it just feels like it It just never recovers from its poor start. It just, just, again, there are some fun action sequence. It, you know, there's, I love being able to see Coruscant and, you know, you get a little window into like what, that planet looks like after hearing about it in the books and it's shown to a small extent in the phantom menace and it's just that kind of it doesn't develop any but i mean anakin i guess develops a bit you know but obviously he's on well on his way to becoming darth vader so you can't really criticize that because you he is going showing you whether you like it or not his progression to you know a confused child to being kind of this tormented young man but unfortunately it exposes a lot of the problems with star wars writ large it's you know what i mean it's some of the complexities that would make a story like that compelling are just aspects of 
You can't really get into sexuality. You can't get into jealousy. You can't get into, again, I don't remember where I had read this. Maybe it was a magazine article. It might've been from this person who I've referenced other times, this guy that, who was like a Jesuit priest that would do these things called the virtual editions. He had kind of talked and you can find some tendrils in the story that there, that one of the big aspects that was never developed in, in the, the second pre second and third prequel movies was this idea that Anakin couldn't, he thought that uh, Padme and uh, Obi-Wan had a more of a connection and that there was almost a love triangle, whether it was real or, or imagined on Anakin's part, which, again, I would have thought would have probably been a, a way would have explained a lot of the things in the original trilogy about like, oh, you know, why Obi-Wan is so cagey about explaining aspects of his father's downfall when it's like, well, you know, your mother and I were had a connection or whatever, you know. But my point is, is that because George doesn't want to have that kind of stuff in star Wars. And I, and I would, I would say that I understand where that comes from because it's it, as you do that stuff, you lock into certain real world concerns and it takes it away from your, from the, the fantasy of the movie. And, but the problem is, is that it, there's so little emotional investment in their love story and so little, investment in in this mystery that obi-wan is trying to unravel and the aspects of this development of this as the galaxy starts is on the brink of some kind of war that we don't quite understand what the beef is it's there's no there's no place that there's nothing you can hold on to it's like there's a lot of interesting characters that don't get used i mean there's the Dooku left the Jedi Order, yet it's never explained. You literally have a young man who is finding himself betwixt his human desires and his his obligations to an uh, you know a priesthood. And then there's an example about a guy who left the priesthood, yet w- nobody ever makes the connection that oh, like maybe it would be interesting to have connected. You know, like, oh, you mean other people have left the order? Maybe I could leave the order. You know, this thing of it just seems like all the characters are on a track and it has to end with them getting married. Anakin having committed a uh, a, a murder or a crime that is inexcusable and it, and he has to carry that around kind of thing like i did this terrible thing but i don't i love you and we need to be together it's it just feels like everything happens because that's what george thought he needed to do on in that beat and none of it works he did hire a guy um to come in and work on it but it's again it's that i think he only wanted feedback in small aspects and it was just in the love story it's like and so it would make me wonder it's like oh my god what was that love story before was it jonathan hales came in and and took a pass at it i mean there was a uh there is a fella he did a it was called the phantom editor and he's one of these people that did uh you know very popular 10 15 years ago when dvd ripping software was very common people were creating fan edits left and right and he was the guy that had, he was called the Phantom Editor. And he had created a version, like a 90 minute version of the Phantom Menace that cut out most of Jar Jar Banks. And it, anyway, um, he did do a version of Attack of the Clones. And, you know, again, I don't feel like you can really put, once you've seen the movie, it's like you can't really go back and, and envision it in a different way. But what was interesting in his commentary is that he broke, he told you exactly when this movie stopped working, you know, and it's George may have taken these criticisms in a more profound way than we want to even realize because it is the empire slot. You know, it's the, it's, it's the movie that when people walked out of the second movie in his original trilogy, they were like shaking their heads thinking, how could he have made a movie that's actually in a lot of ways better than the first one? How did he do that? And then to turn around and actually make a sequel that's 
worse than the first one, you know, and it's got all the earmarks of an artist who generally should probably just trust his instincts, trying to work against his instincts. And I'm going to fix all the stuff that people didn't like, but I'm going to do it in a way that seems organic. And I mean, in some regards, you can kind of figure that he cor- course corrects in the next movie and it and is able, in my opinion, is able to, in, for the most part, stick the landing. But it's, yeah, this movie is just, visually, it's it's fun to watch. I mean, the soundtrack is chopped up to all all bits. And again, the dialogue is, is very rough. But And every opportunity seems to be, again, I'm repeating myself. I, it, it has all the earmarks of a, of a person trying to course correct and getting way off track. I don't have too much more to add to that analysis because it was very spot on. But I would say that the failure of the romance has its roots in the failure of episode one. Um, It's very awkward that this romance even happens between these two people based on the age difference and how they meet and their interactions in the first film. The few things that they could have done to try and make it work, they didn't do. Um, There's no real nostalgic connection between the two people i mean the first time you know we see anakin interact or whatever he's he's freaking out about how he you know wants to see her and how he's going to see her and obi-wan's like chill and why we don't get his motivation to be that into her and then the fact that she dismisses him or doesn't even really you know i mean she acknowledges that he is who who he is but beyond being like hey we had that adventure back when you were a kid no connection on her part but then suddenly magically you know by the third act of the film she's professing love for him because she thinks she's going to die in 20 minutes none of that makes any sense and then this is supposed to be the foundation of you know there's two core stories that we need right one is well how did vader become vader right and then two what what happened with that relationship that produces luke and leia right so was that was he you know happily married before and a dad and and then suddenly he gets turned or what and the the answer that Lucas gave us was deeply unsatisfying you know the dialogue was the was absolutely the worst part of that film for me I, you know the the love story portion was so terribly acted and delivered i mean if you if you could take that out of the film it would be better uh, but there is a lot of extra stuff that gets in the way of telling the story. And I remember when I, when I saw this one, it was the first time I walked away from a star Wars movie going, I really need to think about this on whether or not I can say I liked it. Cause when I first saw Phantom Menace, if you asked me, I was like, it's great. It's awesome. And then, you know, after years of coming, you know, very familiar with it, it's like, okay, yeah, I, I recognize these are problems and you know, whatever. And, it's not not the best Star Wars movie ever and whatnot, but still initially in my reaction to to Phantom Menace, it was like that was fun, that was good, you know, give me more Darth Maul, right? Even though you cut him in half and threw him down a, a, a tube. But this movie, I walked out of it, and I was like, ooh, I don't know, maybe I should probably see that again because I don't really, I'm not really feeling it. And a lot of it was that relationship between Padme and and Anakin, but there's other stuff like the speeder chase, uh, the dialogue in that is terrible the i know they're trying to establish this relationship between anakin and and obi-wan as anakin's an unruly pupil and all this stuff but it just again i don't know if it's if it's lucas's directing of the actors or the problems we, we've talked about this in other shows and you know it's been talked about a lot is like is the problem that most of the stuff these people were doing was in an empty warehouse in front of green screens and it's like they don't have any real frame of reference on what they're supposed to be doing or how they're supposed to be feeling or no way for them to get into the scene because there's no scene around them. I don't know, but there's, there's a lot of stuff that just doesn't work in that movie. And I feel like of all the, the performances that were delivered by the actors that carry through this trilogy, uh, these were the worst performances by the core cast at, you know, either completely or for a majority of the film from, you know, Hayden Christensen and Ewan McGregor and, and Ellie Portman and, you know, others. 
Um, but I do, I mean, the, again, like all the first, these first two movies, there are, there are some great moments. There's some great visuals. There's, there is some fun dialogue, you know, and, and, but it was a real rough, you know, middle entry to this trilogy. And to Robert's point, it's like when, when we saw the original trilogy, the second one was the best. Then we go into the, the prequel movies and you're like, wow, you, you know, we thought you, you hit rock bottom, but apparently, you know, you're still digging. It was disconcerting. I, it got to, I think this is where my enthusiasm as a Star Wars fan really started to kind of taper off. Yep, I was fully invested. I was going to go see the third entry. But this is when I stopped buying toys again. And I stopped being that crazy Star Wars person. That was that moment where I was like, it, it's this is just too much. Like, it's just bad. We got to stop this. Many people blame Portman and Christensen. Many people blame the writing direction. <laughs> it's a lot. Is it all of the above? Which of those aspects is most to blame? I, I honestly, I, I'm a, I'm a strong believer. It, it always comes down to the, the writing and the dialogue. I mean, there's always a well-turned exchange or, or, or uh, interaction can, you know, you can get a lot done. Is Hayden Christensen a great actor? I, I don't know. I mean, that's the thing. I've only seen him in, I've only seen him in like three things uh, or four things. And I mean, it's pretty well known. I think that Lucas is like, has this weird issue with actors and, you know, it's, he would kind of lament if I could just, you know, get them all like, if I could, if he could just make them all CGI too, he would probably do that. Well, at this point in his filmmaking career, when he's literally grafting multiple different takes together using cgi and moving characters i mean it's 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 funny too because now you can watch the movie and i can actually you can actually tell when stuff has been uh, manipulated digitally like head movements and things like you can actually see like interactions where it's like their heads do something weird and they're like oh that's because they weren't in that part of the room when this happened and they moved them or they looped a motion to make it extend longer. And so, but it all comes, my point is it all comes down to the writing. I mean, at a certain point, it's like Natalie Portman's not my favorite, but she could at least, she could have got the job done. I don't think it's a, I think Lucas just has a fundamental issue about showing warmth between human beings. And I mean, I know that sounds kind of mean, but it's, it is. I mean, that's, there's a story that I read in, I Again, I think it was in like one of these making ofs or whatever about the Phantom Menace that Liam Neeson had to f kind of argue with George at the time when he tells Shmi that she's going to be staying. He comes from behind and puts his hand on her shoulder and asks her if she's going to be OK. George didn't want to do that. He didn't. Uh, he's like, no, nope. Neeson had to kind of push for it. And my point is, is that. You know, without a strong actor personality, you got a couple of teenagers doing probably first like kind of romantic, adult romantic stuff. A director who was comfortable with this stuff would know how to get it. But I mean, the, the, the dialogue's not there. The writing, the reasoning's not there. I mean, this is the guy that when he was when he was controlling the show, it was like a peck on the cheek kind of thing for luck. That's his loving or or the guy, I care, I care, you know, that kind of it's cartoonish in the in the book version, which I assume is always based off the screenplay. You know, she ta tells a story about falling, having a crush on a uh, another young man that's in politics. And it kind of the aspect is that Anakin gets kind of almost jealous that the idea that she's even been uh had feelings for another man that's not him and it's like kind of that thing or like if you you know ultimately it's like this guy is going to become darth vader it would have probably been better to show kind of a covetous nature and, and jealousy i think there was a deleted scenes where he like i don't it doesn't really work where she, he actually meets her entire family and all this stuff but you know it's just that Again, I think it's really I think it's the writing. I think it's there's acting is not brain surgery. It's like, you know, you have to have something to 
to say and you get directed so you know where to stand when the camera's on so it's like as long as you're a decent actor you're going to be able to pull it off but you know this this kind of stuff like i'm suffering and i don't like sand and it's not it's rough and it's not smooth like you these and it's just like you could have twisted that in a way to have added some humor and some levity and made it made the audience actually go like, you know, you go into this thing knowing that they're going to get together and they're going to have a child. They're going to have twins and it's things aren't going to go well for any of them. So, again, my point is, is that even George farmed out some of this and he would go like, well, right, you know, Jonathan Hale's he's the guy that did this. And it's like, well, no, George, it's like you didn't you made you set the die and this is where it ended up it's like if you had thought about where you were gonna where you needed to end up you would have done this differently so again i think it's 100 percent in the writing absolutely starts in the writing the exchanges that they have that are supposed to be romantic aren't poorly written and dumb and then the getting to know you stuff is recitation of personal stories, but no connection. I tell a story about this. Oh, then I tell a story about that. And then I tell a story about this. You're like, okay, great. That's getting to know you. That's first date stuff. Fine. But when she's talking about her career as a politician and Anakin's like, well, I'm glad you decided to serve. Okay. Well, that's, that's the, that's an opening statement, but then, you know, maybe say something about, your connection to her in the sense that, you know, your order and being a Jedi Knight is about service and saying, I understand this level of commitment and how difficult it is. And I understand the call to service and we have, we share that. We have that in common. He doesn't do that. He's just like, we got our two. (laughs) And then you walk off. So it starts with the, with the writing, but I also think that some of the delivery of this stuff is, you know, Hayden Christensen is either looking creepily at people shouting or shouting and crying his delivery about i wish i could just wish it away well first of all that's the worst sentence ever the way he delivers it it's like i know how i'm gonna get this girl to love me i'm gonna shout at her and cry at the same time that it just it doesn't it doesn't work but lucas if he wrote it and it wasn't working or if he wrote it and his actors weren't delivering it right that falls on him as a director, too. I mean, the end result of this is after having written this poor dialogue and then watching these people butcher it with their mouths and then editing it in the editing bay and then saying this is is worthy of being released to thousands of theaters across the nation. Um, that's all on him. I will, I will finish by saying this in a in a series of films that is based on the fantastical and the fictional and the unbelievable, uh, the most fantastical, fictional, and unbelievable thing about it is the love story between the main characters. First, let me say, for the record, Attack of the Clones is not my least favorite George Lucas Star Wars film. But I've just never been able to square a woman falling in love <laughs> with a man who, who just shared with you that he's capable of killing women and children uh, in his anger. It just that does not speak to love, but it's so bizarre for him to share that and for her to think, you know what? He's capable of murder. I love that about a guy. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, no, it's like you're absolutely right. I mean, it's like, could you imagine how I hate the word, but it's delicious. It would have been if the only person that knew the truth about that was uh, Palpatine. And that's the that's the flex point. Rather than, the, you know, yes, the aspect he might lose her. And again, we're, I'm jumping ahead. But that secret, I mean, and that's the thing. That's a universal thing. People would have picked it, been like, yeah, it's the it's the it's the lie. It's the lie. It's the thing that you could never admit to that. And then you gave it to the person. And the only person that you could confide in is literally the worst person in the world to confide that sort of thing into. And it would have been so, it could have been, you know, in the climax of the story, the dialogue, he comes out, it's like, that day I killed all of them. And that was the day. It's like, you know, this is what happens when people don't share what they've written 
with you know i think all writers need to have trusted readers all of them that's the that's what every successful writer i've ever read says they have somebody it might be their wife it might be their agent it might be their editor it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be magical it doesn't have to be some ultimate star it doesn't have to be some ultimate star wars fan or something it just has to be someone that you trust that you know has a good sense of this and i think anybody else would have said george let's take another pass at this he's very good at playful back and forth george seems to understand that he'll have characters and situations and a little levity will come through an interaction and that gives you the feeling of of chemistry or developing chemistry between characters. Han and Leia, Raiders of the Lost Ark, many examples between Indy and Marion. You feel a bond. You feel a, an affection growing there, or in this case, rekindling. But to write a love story, to write a romance, um, how many romances did he experience in his life you, you write what you know, and it doesn't appear that George knows romance. I think his, you know, yeah, you say write what you know. I think his portrayal of Luke and Leia in episode four, before it all got weird, I guess, I don't know if it's biographical in a way. I mean, it's less popular dude meets the prom queen and gets the super crush. And then the quarterback of the football team rolls in and, you know, ruins it for him. Han doesn't really give a rip about Princess Leia in the moment. But the minute Luke says, well, you know, I kind of like her, man. I think, what do you think? And then he just turns the knife on Luke and he's like, well, what do you think, kid? You know, a princess and a guy like me. And you know, by the time we you know, get into the, about the first third of the, of the next movie, we realize that something else has happened here. Uh, there's more to you than money. And sure enough, we found out he, I don't know. I don't know about his love life, but from what we've read about him and some of these anecdotal conversations and like the whole thing we're talking about with with Liam Neeson talking about the human element and the warmth and the empathy, maybe this is why George has had problems in his relationships. I don't know. Or maybe this is why George can't write good love stories because he doesn't have that full capacity to be a romantic. I don't know, maybe he, maybe he views marriage and relationships kind of like his films, right? It's a project, it's a process, it's a thing you have to do. And, you know, you, you, there's, there's a right way and a wrong way, and you, you, you do the steps and you, you say the words, and, and then it happens. But as a writer or as a filmmaker or as someone who is in a, this creative industry of telling stories and uh, stories about people, there's enough movies he could watch or there's enough books that he could read or enough plays he could go see where he could get the right inspiration or he could get the right dialogue or the right direction. And it just feels like it's completely closed off to him. Like, did he only just watch Flash Gordon serials and then go into Hollywood and make movies? Like, there's enough of that stuff, even in Westerns and even in other action films and war movies hundreds if not thousands of examples that he could have observed and drawn from and ripped off even if blatantly plagiarized you know he, there's enough shakespeare out there you can figure out a good love story there's just something there i don't know but written directed by george lucas period end of sentence there's no more credits were the special effects in attack of the clones worse than the phantom menace the scenes in attack of the clones were a little bit more ambitious a little bigger in scale a little faster, what what have you. But I asked that question. I, I feel like the special effects in The Phantom Menace flow better, and I don't have those moments where it, it's it's breaking my suspension of disbelief. Attack of the Clones is the first Star Wars movie that was completely filmed using a digital camera. So I always feel that there's a sh- it has a sheen on it that, for lack of a better term, a fakeness to it. Personally, I... L- really enjoy the uh the ground battle aspects at the end of the movie on geonosis so much so that i would say that that was probably my having 
wanting to see that movie multiple times is kind of like that aspect of it. But that's, I mean, that's almost essentially a completely animated sequence. Um, but as much as I, like I said, as much as I like seeing Coruscant, some of that's, some of it just when they, when they're actually walking around and stuff like that, it's just, it looks bad. It's, it just get it's awkward, but yeah, I think it's, I always wonder if like eventually they will take another pass at these things because it, they are just, some of it just looks a bit like, it looks very 2002. You look at it and you go, yeah, it's 2002. That's what 2002 level amount of uh, computer power can buy you. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, moments in G- on Geonosis that are absolutely amazing when they first introduce the the beasts that are supposed to be executing Obi-Wan and, and um, Padme and, and Anakin. And, and those initial moments, those things look fantastic. They're incredibly detailed. They're very well done very realistic in their movements and how they work. But when we start interacting with them, when we start seeing the battle in the arena, those are terrible. It's weird because then you go, you have that stuff and then you wind up, like Robert said, that battle at the end. And probably the reason why it looks so good is because it's a hundred percent computer generated. And that way you're not trying to mash in the, the weird or the perspective of a live actor in that. But that thing at the end was fantastic too. But Dooku on his his speeder bike, Django at the end of the the factory sequence looks terrible. And I I think most of it is when we try and merge live action with fully digitally rendered backgrounds and other actors. Yeah, it, it's weird because several years between these movies and their post-production processes we've got better more powerful computers we've got better more powerful rendering software we've got more people working on these who've been doing it now for a while and they understand tips and tricks and whatever and you know life hacks and how to make it better it it comes across in some aspects of that movie but there's other parts of it where you're just like again how do we how did we make it worse this stuff is supposed to be getting better and it just it, it didn't work. It did have Yoda with a lightsaber, and that seemed to satisfy a lot of people. Um, critically, I don't think it did as well as The Phantom Menace, but audiences seemed to like it more. There was more action. This will take us into the final film. Uh, is it fair to say that Revenge of the Sith is the movie that we enjoy most from the prequel trilogy. I, I would say, yeah, I enjoy it on several levels. I, I enjoy it as a film. I enjoy it as a, a so endless source of Revenge of the Sith memes. <laughs> yeah, I would say it's, it's the one I, I enjoy the most. I, I go back and watch it the most. There's a lot. Of, I mean, there's a lot of stuff to love in it. Um, I think it's the least... There's plenty of cringe in the the prequel trilogy, and I think it's the least cringy. Um, they definitely, it's it's yeah. I mean, I think lessons learned, right, and put into action. So from Attack of the Clones to Revenge of the Sith, obviously completely different films in terms of what they need to accomplish and where the story needs to go. It's the only PG-13 movie in the group of six, the original trilogy and the prequels. Why is it a better film and what credit can we give to Lucas for making it so? The sad truth of it is that the reason I enjoy it the most is this is the one that has the most connection to the original trilogy. You know, it kind of ties it ties it up in in a lot of I mean, until Rogue One, it's like it was essentially the connection between the the two trilogies and there's some, I, I mean, there's some legitimately, I think, good dialogue. I still, to this day, um, love the uh, whole opera scene. Ian McDiarmid and, and Hayden, where he tells the story of Darth Plagueis. And it's just, I mean, it's it, it's bittersweet in some respects because it realizes when there is a problem in these movies, it does come right down to writing because the writing in that scene was excellent. It is subtle and quotable 
and the acting obviously uh ian is a fantastic actor the silver lining to the cloud that is uh the rise of skywalker is the fact that he was that he got to play that character one more time um it had its own issues and it's can be a, a little over long and again some of the cringy you know i want to raise our baby on naboo and all that stuff but again he gets into that like i think i I said on a previous episode that his small experimental film aspect it's the kind of like the padme's lament where she's pondering their situation with this eerie otherworldly music for just 30 seconds or whatever it's so for a star wars movie it's very deep a lot of it is ian mcdermott and, and hayden christensen interacting to be honest a lot of the best parts of that again it still has some of the issues the attack of the clones but the action's good i think the music's really good the whole approach of the uh the two jedi starfighters it's you don't you can't see all the ships are in this battle and it just doesn't make sense that the ships aren't there until they cross this one barrier it's still very visually it's everything that you would want Star Wars to look like when you're thinking about Star Wars is that like, you know, rather it being 20 ships, it's 2000 ships fighting and it's, there's no compromise. And it's, it's like just a visually amazing palette of explosions and smoke and, you know, all this, all the stuff that doesn't happen in space, but you still love it when you see it. We've, we've been a little over harsh on, on George and the previous films. And we've talked about how all the blame for everything bad lays at his feet in those movies. And, and I would say that the opposite is true in this film. Everything that is good about this movie is also his fault. Um, he's, I don't know if, if maybe the process of getting back into this and writing and directing and whatnot, he was getting better or maybe having the clarity of understanding that he and there's a very specific story to tell and he has to get to the point, which is, you know, what Robert mentions, we have to connect to the next trilogy. Um, so maybe he was a little more focused in this one. So he couldn't wander around and have the mystery that didn't really mystery or, you know, the love story that didn't really love and, and all that kind of stuff. It's like, no, we have, we have to get here and we have to have Vader and, and the emperor and Tarkin standing on the deck of a star destroyer at the end of the movie. And, yeah, you know, I, I, he he pulled it off. You know, to to use Robert's phrase, he stuck the landing. It's a gorgeous movie. Uh, there's uh, the intro. I love the intro to it with the space battle over Coruscant. There's a lot of great characters in it. You know, General Grievous. Um, there's a lot of quotability in this particular movie. It's the best, you know, obviously, of the of the prequels, but it. it it kind of feels like maybe, I don't know, like the first two movies, you know, George was warming up, you know, kind of loosening the arm, right? And now he's now he's pitching. And it, it felt more concise and, and more linear in the sense of the storytelling that was going on. Uh, the, you know, the, the things that were happening there made sense and they, they led into each other better. It felt more organized. We, we we can blame George for the bad stuff, but we also have to acknowledge the good stuff, and this one was much better. I agree with everything previously stated, and I would include a plug for Ewan McGregor in the film. I think he brings a lot to it. Um, since it came out on DVD, I'd gotten an inkling of what was happening in deleted scenes. There are shadows of it in dialogue. To see the arc with Padme and Mon Mothma and Bail Organa founding what essentially will become the Rebel Alliance and doing that without Anakin's knowledge because he's too close to Palpatine, jeopardizing the the love, the personal relationship there, the marriage, particularly the the deleted scene where the, the group is presenting a petition to Palpatine and you have Padme on one side of the desk and you have Anakin standing behind Palpatine on the other side of the desk. I wish those scenes had been included in the film. I think they're terrific. Yeah, it definitely would make it, I mean, it makes it more, I don't know, believable. I mean, not to say that it wasn't believable, but it helps. I think one thing in this film that might have been a little quick, especially with the deleted scenes, is 
the way their relationship falls apart. It came together rather quickly and awkwardly, and it kind of fell apart the same way. Why can't she go down this path with him? I mean, she was okay with him murdering all the, the sand people. She's excused some very egregious and heinous things on the part of her husband before. Uh, so I don't know. I, it, but by including those scenes that you talk about, it, it does start to show the division and the breakdown and the symbolism and the the you know the visual that that scene provides that Palpatine and Anakin are on one side and and everybody else is on the other. I mean, Lucas really is, kind of does sort of hit his stride as a visual storyteller with some things. The fact that some of the better moments in this movie are scenes where nobody's talking, waiting to find out about the arrest of Palpatine. Anakin is pacing and and getting really agitated. He doesn't want to stay at the temple. Padme is at the point where she's, you know, conflicted about her relationship with Anakin, like she doesn't know what's going on. Nobody has to say anything, and we know exactly what's going on. And through the use of of music and through cinematography, we get the full emotional impact of that stuff. I, I just said, I wish they had maybe done it more in the other movies. You know, that that if you again play to your strengths, right? If you don't, if you don't know how to write, then maybe have less dialogue. If you're a visual storyteller, rely on, on the pictures, right? Use use the setting and the tone and the lighting to communicate that stuff to the audience. And so, I mean, he does a lot of that. It's a lot better in this. Um, Mustafar is one of those things, right? Everybody talked about Mustafar and the battle between, you know, Anakin and Obi-Wan and all that stuff and how it had to happen and it had to be a certain thing and had to be epic and and it was definitely epic and long and also completely absurd um, even though it's supposed to be the 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 climax of climaxes in this trilogy right it's the ultimate battle it's the end of the jedi order and the relationship between obi-wan and and anakin and it's the true birth of vader and in, in, in what we as 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 we know him or as we knew him when we were first introduced to him but, you know, other than the end when we have Kentucky Fried Anakin shouting, I hate you, Adam, it's like that we could have trimmed off like 10 minutes of that and just been done with it. But still gets us to that point, like at the very end, I remember seeing this in the theater and when when Vader and Palpatine and and uh, Tarkin were standing there at the end and they're seeing the beginnings of the Death Star, I just I, I lost it. I was like, this is so amazing. This is the greatest thing ever. So. I think we we kind of got the we got the reward for suffering through talk of sand and um, love talk and Jar Jar and all that other junk. It was the big payoff. I think less dueling would have been an improvement and would have left room for the scenes that I mentioned, uh, the founding of the alliance and and breaking of the trust between husband and wife. Pretty much all of the duels, the confrontations feel a bit long. Visually, they're they're interesting, but y- you could really trim it down. I mean, really, when you think back to the original trilogy, the sword fighting is is terrific, and obviously you could take it levels higher. But it's not the action of the sword fighting; it's the interaction between the characters which makes the scene. It's not how many times they can be swinging on a piece of wreckage and passing each other and clashing sabers. That's not really what's going to stay with us. That's, yeah, really um, maybe a little less. Yeah, I guess it's a situation that a guy like Lucas, who's known more for these incredible sci-fi action duels and, you know, this thing of like, well, this is the last time we're ever going to be able to show a lightsaber duel in a movie. And it would, we don't want to undersell it, but really it's like that, it starts out so bombastic with a a rescue scene on multiple levels and elevators and ships crashing. And, and, you know, then there's all these battles and it's, it would have probably behooved Lucas to have slowly, but surely cranked down the action as the thing and, and increased the emotion to the, 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 yeah, like you were saying, the, the, take it to the point of like this is really an interpersonal aspect this is this is about them as people it's not about them as warriors and 
you know, all we get is like, I hate you. And it's, it should have been a lot more of it should have been a lot more of Anakin venting his spleen about the things that he felt that Obi-Wan didn't do for him. Maybe as a, you know, almost like a, a Luciferian manipulation, almost that's like Palpatine is teaching. It's an outward thing. It's not, it's never, the problem is never with me. It's with how others treat me. And it could have been like that. It would have been a nice dovetail because then it could have showed rather than just screaming, I hate you, like some petulant 15 year old that got grounded because they got caught smoking. It becomes like this thing where you could just really have hooked something into him that would have really ate away at him in that desert for all those years as he was sitting there and thinking about the things that Anakin had said to him that day when he effectively killed him. You know, it would have been a nice touch, but, you know, I understand it's a big, big movie and it's, it's hard to take your foot off the gas sometimes, especially for George. True. The end of that, if we had sort of cycled down into a more introspective or more interpersonal film towards the end, you know, there's, there's a movie called seven days in May. It's got Burt Lancaster and, and, uh, Kirk Douglas in it. And it's not the best movie ever made, but it is. I have a special place for it in my heart. The scene at the end, you know, spoiler alert, the movie's been out for 50 years, okay? But the scene at the end um, where Burt Lancaster is confronted by Kirk Douglas, he's, these are two men who are in the military. Um, they're both high-ranking officers. And if this movie was made in 2021, it would end with a lightsaber duel like in episode three. But this movie ends with these two men confronting each other in an office standing there and talking nobody shouts nobody raises their fists or throws a chair at anybody but these two guys talk about their idea of what america is and what it should be and how to achieve it and then it ends with kirk douglas basically saying i looked up to you you were my mentor and I am now extremely disappointed and heartbroken that you've turned into this and that you're violating your oath and turns around and walks out of the office. Right. And that's, and it's one of the most heavy, emotional, deep conversations in film. And it's about a mentor betraying the trust of his, of, you know, his student or apprentice or whatever you want to call it. It's about honor and courage and like all these things. And, and, it's amazing what you can do with that stuff if you do it right. And I think that you could have had a very similar confrontation between Anakin and Obi-Wan. And then maybe at the end when Anakin turns around and to walk off, that's when the lightsaber duel starts. And then it can be fairly quick, not as quick as Obi-Wan killing Darth Maul in the Rebels cartoon, please and thank you. But it could be quicker than the 25 or 30 minute spectacle that we got at the end of the film where they're dancing on scaffolding and tiptoeing across lava. But again, I, I think that we were told that this was the great epic battle that, and it's had been discussed by people, Lucas and others about, you know, this was this great confrontation, great battle. And it's like when you've had a movie like episode three, which starts off pretty high speed if you've already started, you know, almost at high at, at max volume, I mean, you can't turn it up much more, but they tried. And I think you, you, you got action fatigue in that moment. And I think it, it took away some of the, the importance of what was actually going on there between these two people. But still, hey, we wound up with Darth Vader in his Darth Vader suit. So it wasn't all bad. No. Well, except for that part. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of the marketing yeah. featured Darth Vader, and I knew that we wouldn't we wouldn't have much. I still, to this day, don't know how I feel about the Frankenstein's monster situation there at the end. I don't know. I always love the part that Palpatine's kind of like laughing. Yeah, Anakin's freaking, or Anakin Vader, whatever, is freaking out. And yeah, Palpatine just has that smile on his face. You're like, yep. I think maybe at that point, it's just him, manu- again, continuing to manipulate Anakin. He's he's already gone to the dark side, butchered kids. He's fought his mentor. He's killed Jedi. He's done all this stuff. He's already in emotional turmoil. He's lost his legs and his arm. 
he's at the end, right? He's at the end of his, his mental strength and emotional strength. He's just completely broken. And then, and then Palpatine's like, oh, and another thing. Yeah, whatever was left of Anakin Skywalker in that moment, whatever was left of an independent, free-thinking individual that might potentially turn against Palpatine is gone when he drops that hammer on him. He's like, oh, yeah, that one thing, the one thing that you were trying to do, that one job you had, Anakin, to save your wife, you know, to keep her from pain and keep her from suffering. And all that. Yeah, you killed her. Ah, Revenge of the Sith. So the prequel trilogy ends, and I promise to compare ask about the comparison between Lucas from the original trilogy and Lucas from the prequel trilogy, not to compare necessarily the quality of the films. I think we've gone into great detail on that already, but differences, two different eras of Lucas's life, uh, not too long after revenge of the Sith, uh, seven years later, he'll, he'll sell everything to Disney. But we look at these two eras. What, what do we take? from them what do they tell us about lucas what do we learn yeah i guess ultimately that my takeaway of all this is that you know for all the criticisms we make like oh you know he embraced the commercialism he embraced the toys i honestly think that these stories meant a lot more to him than he actually ever wanted to admit which is kind of funny because he acts like, oh, it's, you know, he talks about a lot about it. But I, I honestly think that he's always kind of tried to keep a certain amount of distance only because of his filmmaking peers, you know, being like wanted to be respected as a filmmaker. And it's really about making the visual medium. And I, I think it's really he was a he wanted to tell that story. He wanted to have an an epic long form narrative that for better or worse is is his it's you know like tolkien had his and herbert had his and you know a lot of people that have these stories that they have to get out which you know generally are developed for children of all ages as i like to say i think that has to do a bit of his his motivation of, of of selling to disney i think it's in some regards i i wonder if that was a uh protective thing on his on his part of being like you know i bet you i'm gonna get tempted and i'm advancing in age and i know what this takes out of me because i honestly think if he had taken on the the mantle of of three more movies i honestly think they probably would have been just as divisive and controversial and and that the the way he told those stories would not it would not be just a continuation of what he had done in from 77 to 83 i think he would have been maybe emboldened more so but he didn't want to he didn't want to go down that road again he was kind of like you know on some level he felt well if i give this over to somebody else but his comments were like it's it's regret you know it's a it's like part of him is like wishing like can i turn back the clock 20 years and and if i was in my 50s again i would i would make those three sequels in a heartbeat with what I know now, uh, you know, I think it's just a matter of I think he somebody either himself or somebody in his in his world got him thinking that maybe he should be doing something else. And he kind of walked away from it. And I won't say prematurely. I'll just say it's like that he really does get invested in them when he's making them. So it's kind of sad that we're not going to get any more of that. I'd always wish that he'd take his outlines and flesh them out into some book form that we could read maybe his take on it but yeah like i said it's in some regards i just think it's the same guy it's just he's just older and slightly more refined but maybe not refined in the way that we would want him to be early lucas and his you know his legacy i guess his legacy right the early lucas's legacy is that he changed film forever and then his later legacy is be changed film forever again. And I think the, the long term thing is he's probably the only person who's done that twice. All of the special effects things that they did in the 70s and the establishment of the science fiction blockbuster as a viable tentpole for various studios and whatnot, and as a a legitimate entertainment source that was not something to be ashamed of. Uh, and then 
coming back in, in the 90s and early 2000s and showing the world that digital cinema and and creating digital environments in cinema and digital characters in cinema is is a thing that can be done. We can do more with less uh, and we can create film, you know, in our computers and we don't have to have locations or cast of thousands anymore and all this stuff. And, you know, and that was a huge thing. Uh, he he took special effects from being a background thing to being a foreground thing or being the whole thing in a film. I don't know how many other people in the history of cinema you know, have done something so significant twice in their career. So, uh, you know, if the long term legacy, you know, all of the old Star Wars nerds are going to die and then all of our collections are going to wind up in a landfill and people are going to forget the cultural phenomena of Star Wars. But in the history of cinema, George Lucas is going to be, you know, kind of almost Mount Rushmore worthy with like the Lumiere brothers and, you know, others. Yeah, he's, it is sad to see, you know, as with all great artists, whether it be musicians or actors and actresses or athletes or whatever, uh, as you see them on the, you know, the decline or on the, on the, back end of their career it's sad to see that we aren't going to get more of this from george and it was it was a shock i had mixed feelings you know when he sold to disney at the time i was on record as having said that disney wasn't doing too bad with you know the marvel situation and that they can handle big big properties like that and do it right and i was so wrong but Whatever, you know, that's that's George. And I think that, you know, Robert made a good point that by finally selling it, and even if he regrets having sold it, by finally selling Star Wars off and not having a hand in it anymore other than being like Professor Emeritus of Star Wars, um, it removes the temptation for him to try and go back and do it again. I mean, his legacy is secure, right? I guess with the with the sequel trilogy that came out and it ultimately creating the most backlash from the fans and the most controversy, um, he has secured his legacy as the guy who made the best of the Star Wars movies. <laughs> you know, so um, the, that was probably an unattended happy consequence of selling it to Disney. But yeah, it's it's unfortunate that we don't get the final thoughts from Lucas on where he wanted the sequel trilogy to go and where he wanted his saga to, to continue if at all. Um, but he's in a weird spot now where he's not allowed to talk about it a lot anymore. And the, the comments that he has made and in, in various interviews and things that have come back to haunt him or he's gotten the slap on the wrist from Disney, like, Hey, we're trying to sell movies over here. Please don't disparage the product. Uh, so, but yeah, I mean, he, I, I think he, his legacy is secure in film for sure. Uh, probably in in the annals of science fiction as well, uh, what he's done to mainstream science fiction fandom uh, and make it you know okay for us to walk around and talk about Star Wars and things like that in public and have podcasts and shows and all these things that we do. Um, you know, Robert had mentioned earlier on in our conversation tonight about how you know back in the day you wore the Star Wars shirt, people laughed at you and they pointed at you and they you know called your names. Now you wear the Star Wars shirt. People are like, oh my God, it's so awesome. I love those movies. Right? And, you, and you can actually do it in public and not be afraid to be a nerd. And I think George has a huge hand in that as well. Is there a difference? Yeah, I mean, I guess the prequel trilogy is the result of all the hard labor from the original trilogy. But I don't know. I, I it's, it's hard to, to separate young from old. But, you know, I mean, it's kind of like when you you watch athletes – um, you know, in sports, like the the rookies, you know, they work hard to try and establish themselves as a as a regular, you know, force on a team. And then one of two things happens: they either get complacent and lazy, and then they're they're gone, they're off the team, and they wind up either somewhere else or not playing anymore, or they continue to get better and they become a superstar, and then they maintain for a long period of time. And I think Lucas, he hit a a point in his career after Return of the Jedi where he could have just counted his, his stacks of cash and, you know, done the ranch and 
been a dad and wandered off and hung out with his buddies and, you know, had a Hawaiian shirt and just, that was it. Right. Go full dad mode. Right. But he wanted to continue to achieve and to continue to push boundaries and continue to, you know, be an innovator in film. And in order to do that, he had to make more Star Wars for us. And so I think on, on one hand, everybody won, right? Because he pushed all his boundaries, created all these new things, changed the cinema again, and we got more Star Wars. So that's, again, every, everybody wins on that level. But yeah, I just, it's, it is difficult to try and separate them because it's, it's more of a, a through line, a, a linear projection upward for him for his whole thing until he sold, sold it off. And his final Star Wars project was the Clone Wars to really tie everything together for kids of that generation. We could spend another full episode talking about Lucas preparing to sell and his relationship with Kathleen Kennedy and her rise through Lucasfilm, but a different show. On a sad note, on a down note, I think the film industry is dominated by corporations. The the thing that he did not want to come to pass and the thing that he battled, and I think we, the audiences, are all suffering as a result. I do think he regrets the sale to Disney and not necessarily the sale, but selling to Disney, um, seeing what Disney's done with Star Wars, with Indiana Jones. I think if he had it to do over again, he might sell, but not to Disney. And of course, then that begs the question, well, who who could have afforded it? I, I, I don't know. But um, but he was ready to step aside I don't think he appreciates the stewardship of his uh, of his beloved franchises uh, that that we're seeing from Disney. And obviously there's an element of betrayal there uh, with Kathleen Kennedy uh, thinking that he had someone who would fight the corporatization. But actions speak and I really appreciate the things that he's trying to do in the world now. I'm really enjoying some of the projects that he's taken on, um, the charity work that he's doing. And so uh, in his personal life, obviously, I have no idea how he conducts himself, but at least in his public persona, I think his heart is in the right place. There's a code that he follows. It's his moral compass. And uh, I think it points in the right direction more often than not. So again, wishing him well at the tail end of his great career. A thank you to George Lucas for the impact he's had on my life and so many others. So I think we've reached the finish line, gentlemen. It's just getting there... good, man. We, we buried George. We said some kind words. <laughs> now he's banging on the inside of the coffin saying, let me out. Let me, let me out. I'm not dead here now. <laughs> Melody, can you put some Funyuns in here? The final episode of our George Lucas discussion has come to an end. Thank you, Sean. Hey, wait, wait. Give me a beer. Thank you, Robert. Do you want a wonga? I would say the one thing that I didn't get in was that the uh, the prequel trilogy made me hate 3PO. The lack of initiative is not authorized or endorsed by Lucasfilm Limited. The name Star Wars and all related materials are registered trademarks of Lucasfilm Limited, a subsidiary of the Walt Disney Company, all rights reserved. Galactic Initiative is a registered trademark, and other product and company names are trademarks of their respective holders. Use does not imply affiliation or endorsement.